Boston area, Toy Collectors Club, 14th Annual National Toy This is David Ciccarella for Randolph Community TV, and I'm at the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club, 14th Annual National Toy Event here at the Lantana in Randolph. We're going to see some amazing toys, interview people who organize the event, and see a lot more. So let's go and enjoy the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club. Now I'm standing with the founder and the executive director of the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club, Steve Lanzilla. Uh, now what anniversaries are being held this, today for this event? Well, we're concentrating on three tonight. It's the 75th uh, anniversary of the creation of Batman, and we have a featured speaker tonight to really set us all in the right mood of what was happening in the United States in the late 1930s that gave him such a strong impact when kids went into stores to see the first Batman items in May of 1939. Uh, second to that, uh, we are obviously very cognizant as collectors of die-cast cars, whether it's Matchbox branded or others. So we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Ford Mustang. Uh, Lee Iacocca rolled that out in 1964 and a half. It actually was too late to be called a 1964 model and it was too early to be called a 1965. The third one, is the man from uncle. Nowadays, not very many people recognize the significance of that television show. So for the man from uncle exhibition here, which was basically a, a spy genre TV show themed along the line of a secret agent such as James Bond, mm -hmm. uh, we have a number of toys and paraphernalia that you would have seen uh, in the year 1964 and shortly thereafter. Um, there were comic books, there were collector cards, many books, um, games such as this one here. Uh, some people call it a bagatelle, uh, a French term for basically a pinball machine. And this one here is a particularly nice one because it captures a lot of the flavor of the, um, the spy genre in a television show. And then they went to a different level where they said, maybe like James Bond, we can have a movie. And that resulted in uh, an experiment such as what you see over here. This is the actual uh, movie theater poster, hence the large size, uh, to attract you in to see uh, Napoleon and Ilya Kiriakin, uh, David McCollum and, and Robert Vaughn, to be uh, more accurate. How do you get involved with the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club? It's very easy, uh, painfully easy, actually. We were formed in 1997 as a nonprofit with the mission of uniting all collectors of all genres of toys. So some people only collect very old toys, they want to know what's new in stores. So we cover the whole spectrum, young people, older people. About 45% of the toy collectors out there today actually are women. So it's not a, a meal-centric hobby either. You could go to our website. We have uh, members and observers from all over the world, all continents. Right now, we're becoming very popular in South America. Another way to find us is to come to South Shore Plaza. Uh, on our website, we list our meetings, and we are under the graces, not just of South Shore Plaza, but also Simon Mall Management, uh, the largest owner of malls in North America. They have taken an interest in our mission. So we meet on the food court on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, one Sunday a month. So they only need to find out, you know, when's your next meeting. They can come and sit in. They have no obligation to join. They can say, you know, do I enjoy the other people in the group? Is this something I want to join? Um, it's one time $10 charge, and the annual dues are $25. And the clock starts from the meeting you join. So we have, you know, people joining every month, and, and that's it. And your, your dues are then up 12 months later. So really, again, it's, it's very, very simple. But once you're involved with the organization and you know all these other collectors, items that you have not found, and I'm a perfect example of it, you've got so many other members out there taking an interest in what you collect 
They might find it on a business trip to the state of Washington. They may find it in, in an attic when they go to somebody's yard sale. So the participation of a group mentality of collecting is what we strive for. Collectors by nature are very competitive individuals and they like to be to some extent secretive about what they collect, where they find it, where they buy it and so forth and so on. But the people that belong to our organization don't have to give up any of that. They just realize that this is another addition. Now I'm here with David Campbell, the VIP coordinator. And what table are we uh, standing next to? Uh, this is items from NJ Croce Company. Um, they started out doing bendable figures, Gumby, which, um, you know, a long time ago I had as a kid and stuff like that. Uh, they've done other bendable figures through the years. And um, Simpsons was one line that, that was popular for them this year because of the 25th anniversary of The Simpsons. They've done a huge collectible set that's basically six of their previous sets all together. Um, and it, it's in a, basically a suitcase. Um, and they've done other lines recently. They've continued with their Gumby line, and they've also done superhero lines in the recent years. This year, Batman from 1966 television show was one that they've expanded into and had success with. Last year they had... Um, I believe four, the main ones, Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, um, Wonder Woman, and I think they did the Joker. And then this year they expanded into the Batman from the TV show, and I believe they're going to be expanding into animated series Batman from um, the early 90s. So this company has been around for a really long time? Yes, yeah, a number of years. Wow. Now, that's very interesting. Um, what's that with Batgirl? Could you tell me about that? Well, this is actually a, a design for what they're going to do for a bendable um, Batgirl figure. And I'm not sure exactly when that's going to be coming out, but that's one of their future um, figures that they'll be doing. And that's based off the animated series? Yes, in the, in, back in the 90s. About, yeah, Batman the Animated Series was the title of it, yeah. Great. And just really quick, um, you, there's bendable Simpsons figures, like you said. But let's take a few steps uh, towards these other Simpsons figures. Um, now, these were all uh, d different Simpsons figures done by Playmates. Uh, kind of to round it out because of all the different Simpsons figures that N.J. Croce had done. Um, we took some from one of our club members' collections to kind of round out the table to show some of the other Simpsons because it is the 25th anniversary of the Simpsons being on television. That's amazing. I mean, the figures and also the bendable collectibles have great likenesses likenesses to them. Yes. And then the, the um, NJ Croce has also done a Simpsons clock, so that was one of the other items that they had sent to us. So they do a number of different things along, you know, with the different licenses. Now I'm standing with Steven Sylvia, and what did you bring today? Uh, this is Batman's 75th anniversary, so they asked me to bring Batman stuff in my personal collection. Um, one of my favorites uh, is this game board goes with this box because it actually predates the Batman television show. This is 1965. The Batman TV show is 1966. So that's one of the first Batman toys I ever saw and bought as a kid. This other one here, the Husky Extra Gift Pack. Um, which, which one was that? This one here, the Husky Extra, Extra Gift Pack. It was apparently at the time only sold in Woolworths and that was the first TV Batman related toy I ever saw related to the TV show. Um, my childhood one got played with and lost, so in circa 1989 I found one at a toy show for $25. It seemed expensive then, but apparently now it could go for over $200. People seem to like the Mego Heroes from the mid-70s, little 8-inch dolls. That's what these guys are in the little um, Batmobile. They were sold separately, and that's the box for the, um, for the car there next to it. This one I found at a toy show, somebody just had the body shell from Mattel Switch and Go Batmobile set. It apparently it worked pneumatically. You put down the track and you'd operate it by pushing a little plunger and it would change the pressures and make switches and follow a track on the floor. I don't have the motorized part for it, I just found the body shell. But you never see, or hardly ever see, the Switch and Go Batmobile. 
That's very interesting. Um, you have an original art piece as well um, of Batman? Yes, it's a, what they call a splash page, the first page of the story from the Batman team-up comic Brave and the Bold. And when I saw it offered, it was actually fairly inexpensive at the time. I liked it because it was better than many other covers I had seen for sale for more. Because it has him in an iconic position, you know, swinging down. And even though it was like done maybe um, 16 years after Carmen Infantino started drawing Batman, or stopped drawing Batman, he came back for this, you know, few issues and he kind of redefined the look of Batman in the uh, early 60s. Finally, this is really cool. Um, on the on the box, it has Batman and Robin on a bridge, collapsing with a Joker on it. It says "Boom" on there. Oh, that um, that's Mego comic, comic Action Heroes. They had three or four different sets. Uh, like Wonder Woman is an invisible plane, uh, Justice League playset. Uh, they're very hard to find, apparently. If I'd known that, I would have bought more of them when I found it on closeout for half price for about $4.98, um, circa 78 or 79 when the thing was made. And so, so that goes back to 1978? Yes, yes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I had limited space, which is why it's not displayed on the table. And and you also brought some uh, Black Widow stuff as well, which is right next to the Batman stuff. What's, why, why, why Black Widow? Uh, it's the Black Widow's anniversary as well. I'm not exactly sure. Um, 64 was the first appearance in an issue of uh, Tales of Suspense with Iron Man. And since the toy club people like women that kick ass, they said, it's their anniversary. And so they said, any Black Widow stuff you can bring in. So I gathered up the little few Black Widow pieces that I had and tried to make a nice little display of it. Why do you think Black Widow is so popular? To me, I do not know, because I always thought of her as being a third or fourth tier Marvel character. And then the movie series, she's become a, a breakout, very, very popular character. And I asked someone, why do you think that is? He goes, Scarlett Johansson. Okay, I didn't think of that. In the comic books of the period, they have her running up and down walls with anti-gravity boots, which I don't think you see in the movies. So that, that's an original comic book from when again? 69 or so. I'd have to look at, actually look at the date on it. Wow. But they, they did try and promote it to a star status, and it didn't take. <laughs> but she came into her own now. <laughs> now I'm standing with Steve Perry, the founder and the executive of the Rhode Island Comic Con. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. And the Rhode Island Comic Con is coming up. What do we have in store for this year? Uh, we've made it even bigger than ever. We brought the original Star Trek cast in. We have a big group from Supernatural coming in, Walking Dead. A lot of superheroes, including Luke Ferrigno, William Shatner is coming down, George Takai, Mark Shepard. We've increased our comic base as well. Neil Adams is coming in, Jim Steranko. Really big show this time, definitely. And you have a Halloween party? We do. Uh, Friday night, luckily, happens to be Halloween, and our show will be kicking off with a huge Halloween party on Friday night. Great. And what do we expect for that Halloween party? A lot of scary things. <laughs> definitely. Um, no, we have an... Uh, Halloween party be costume contest, prizes, games, you know, DJ, a lot like that. Now today's Batman's, well, this year is Batman's 75th anniversary, and we're celebrating Batman tonight. Yeah, as you I, see, I, representing Batman. I, 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 where'd, you, where'd you get that? I can't tell you that. I had it made. No, just kidding. Uh -huh. Remarkable, you can actually buy this at the store. <laughs> Surprisingly, people <laughs> put these out there for a random person to buy. Now I'm standing with John DeChico, and uh, you're the co-promoter of the Super Mega Fest convention. Yeah, the New England Super Mega Fest will be on uh, November 22nd and 23rd of this year at the Sheraton Framingham in Framingham, Massachusetts. And what are we what are we looking forward to in Super Mega Fest this year? Super Mega Fest is a pretty uh, good mix of TV, movie, celebrity, science fiction, uh, comic, cosplay rock and roll, wrestling, and, you know, partying, essentially. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, we basically try to have a little bit of um, something for everybody. And in this case, you know, in some, some of the categories, it'll be a lot of, uh, a lot. Now, you usually have uh, concerts at night at, the, at Super Mega Fest? Yeah, we do the Come Together Music Fest, and what we do is we have a couple local artists that play a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, 
60s, 70s and kind of inspired music. And uh, we also bring in artists to do like the greatest hits of. So this year we have Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees. He'll be doing a few of his, you know, biggest hits. And uh, we will also have Mike Skills from the Romantics flying him in from the West Coast to do a couple of his famous songs, What I Like About You and a couple others. I'm here with Susie and Greg, Greg Madison and, or should I say, Batgirl and her henchman, Sidekick. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that's more accurate. Mm -hmm. Are you guys club members? No. no. No, we're not club members. We're friends of Steve. We met him at Comic-Con. Well, I met him at Comic-Con about a year ago, and we both were Batman enthusiasts. So I got on the mailing list, learned a little bit about what he does, and I was invited here tonight, so I came along. Fantastic. And because of its Batman's anniversary, Batman's birthday, as it were, you decided to dress as Batgirl tonight? Yes, I did. And I liked any excuse to cosplay. I'm there, so that's why. But yes, that would be the number one reason. Is this your first time you dressed up as Batgirl? No, this is about my second or third. I've also been known to dress up as Harley Quinn. And, and where did you where did you get that Batman suit? Um, I I just bought it at a uh, at a Halloween store, and that was about it. Bought this today on our way over here, so so it's good. It worked out really well. It was nice. Now I like the suit, but would you dress up as any of the characters? Uh, yes, actually, when she was Harlequin, I dressed up as the Joker, uh, which was actually a lot of fun as well. I enjoyed that one. And what did you en most enjoy about the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club event tonight? I really enjoyed just the laughs we had at our table. We met some really great people. I got to meet Wonder Woman and get my picture taken with her, which I think was the best. And just having all these Batman enthusiasts and not a lot of talk about Superman. I was really excited about that. <laughs> I'm standing with Bob Portia, and you have an amazing collection of Corgi toys. That's correct. Uh, I specialize in Corgi toys uh, from 1956 to 1983, which was uh, when the original owners uh, uh, had the uh, company before they were taken over by uh, private management in 1983. And you have a lot of Batman stuff here today. This is, in, this is Batman's 75th anniversary. And could you, could you show me something that's Batman related? Well, the original uh, Batman, uh, uh, the Batmobile that was produced back in 1966, originally came in a covered box that looks uh, something like this, okay? It has nice graphics associated with it, but when uh, kids used to uh, buy these things, they were more interested in the toy that was inside. These days, a lot of people don't appreciate the fact that the material that's inside, not only is it the model itself that is cool, but it's also the graphics that are very desirable as well. And along, along with these, most people don't realize that there were rockets that fired out of the uh, rocket tubes over here. So all those accessories were always available in the platform of the uh, packaging itself. So it's always desirable that those people that remembered this particular toy always want to have everything complete mitt in a box. So that's what I specialize in. And I noticed that Batman's also in the car as well. Is Robin in there? I can't see. Yes, yes Robin is in there as well. Yeah, both of them were, were in the cockpits, as you can see. So was this to promote the 1966 TV show? Well, uh, what happened was is that uh, the TV show was popular, and then uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Corgi uh, was at Toy Fair, and in February and they they saw the uh, Batmobile itself and then they said oh we have to drop everything and we have to start designing the uh, the car itself and from the time uh, the pictures were taken at Toy Fair in February uh, by the time it was released in October it was only a period of about six months and that's usually at that time that was a phenomenal uh, uh, turnaround time as far as going from drawing board to actually getting the product into the stores Sounds like it. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what's interesting here is you have a set of uh, Corgi gift sets with the Batmobile and the Batboat, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, here's an example of one of those. Okay. Now, when Corgi originally made uh, the uh, Batmobile, they just made this particular model. They, based upon the phenomenal success of, the, uh, of this model, they decided to 
have the bat boat as well that, uh, produced. And even though uh, the original Batmobile did not have a tow hook associated with it, but there was, there was uh, some way that you had to tow the, uh, the Batmobile, the uh, bat boat itself, so, so that's why they incorporated it in there. The original versions of the, uh, of the Batmobile did not have a tow hook. They only had the turbine ex exhaust, okay? And then what happened was is that they, when they developed the bat boat, they had a coupling mechanism for the old Batmobiles in order to fit on there and until, until such time as the casting was modified in order to include a hook uh, with, with this uh, particular set. That's amazing. And then and you have so many of them too and they're all kind of slightly different, aren't well, they? Well, that's, that's correct because uh, what basically happened was is that as I was collecting these particular models, I always wanted to acquire one more in order to have something for sale. And then what I kept on doing is I kept on comparing these particular models to each other and I saw that there was a little bit of a variation between these things. So what I have in my box over here is a, is a set of 10 different, 10 different Batmobile gift set 3s that all are slightly different in one way or another depending upon whether it's graphics or whether it's uh, types of wheels or types of uh, uh, side decals. Uh, sizes of wheels, that sort of thing. There's always something different among all of the ones that I have in this particular arrangement here. And what year did they, they come out? Uh, they started in 1966 and they kept on making this, this uh, Batmobile right up until the uh, close of production in 1983. That's amazing. Uh, one other Batman thing that caught my eye is the Batman on the Bat Cycle. Can you bring that one down? Yeah, sure. When when uh, the, the Batmobile was always popular from 1966 right up until 1983. And in order to capitalize on these things, they, they wanted, the Corgi company wanted to make more and more vehicles that were Batman related. So one of the ones that they produced was this particular model, which was Batman on a, uh, on a uh, motorcycle. Now, this particular one wasn't available back in 1967. This was basically 1977, 1978 vintage. But it was a very, very good seller as well. This particular uh, model was interesting in that, in that uh, the first packaging had a header card with all the graphics on it. And then they decided to cut costs and they decided to uh, just put this in a regular window box. There are particularly rare variations in that these tires that normally appear in black, there were short productions in that the, the uh, tires were all white as well akin to uh, the uh, spider bikes that were made back at the time when they were white, uh, white uh, tires as well. So those, those are particularly desirable as well. Now speaking of other Batman vehicles, you have, uh, there's a, there's a three-pack with the Bat Helicopter, Bat Boat, and Bat Cycle. Could you tell me about that? Yeah, sure. As I said, uh, they were, they, they originally made the Batmobile. Bat Boat was made as well. So now, they needed something else in order to enhance the uh, play value. They wanted something else for the kids to play with. So now, they knew that the uh, Bat Helicopter was also in the series, so they decided to develop a model based upon that. It wasn't an exact model that was in the series. However, uh, it was based upon a casting that was already in the line, but with sufficient graphics and with sufficient... Uh, uh, adjustments to the uh, helicopter wings, that sort of thing. Uh, a kid will take a look at it and they'll say, oh, well, I see Batman in the air, I see the Batman logo. Oh, it, it's something to play with. I'm now with Doreen Grayley, and uh, what brings you here tonight? I love coming to this club meeting because it's so much fun. There's good food, there's good people to talk to, there's always so many awesome toys. And how did you find out about the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club? Some of the uh, fellows who come here, who work here, um, they told me about it, and I decided one year I'll go. Why not? So today's is, is the Batman's anniversary, Batman's birthday this year, and it's celebrating celebrated here tonight. What what did you learn about Batman that you didn't know before tonight? Well, I do know a lot about Batman. He's one of the first comic book characters I ever collected, next to Wonder Woman, which is my favorite. But uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I think, especially about the early stages of Batman and how they figured out how he looked and what kind of poses he had and all the characters involved. I'm now with Arlen Schumer and you wrote and designed the Silver Age of comic book history? Comic book art. Art. 
wow. it's, it's really the first coffee table book about the art and the artwork and the artists of comics. If you notice here on this Batman spread, most comic book art history books were text heavy with miniature reproductions. I wanted to reverse the process so it's all about the art with the text being supplementary. And then in certain places, I take out the original text and I've got the artist talking about the art. So if you look at this Captain America spread by Jack Kirby, this page is not a single page of a comic book that I brought into the book. It's from three separate stories and all of the text is I took out and this is Kirby talking about how he choreographs fight scenes like violent ballets. So every spread you're gonna learn something and you read it like a comic book, but it's a comic book art history book. And it's about the great artists from the 1960s known as the Silver Age. And these guys to me like Joe Kubert, Carmen Infantino, they are our Renaissance masters of the human figure, the way we look back on Michelangelo and Da Vinci and Raphael. I really believe that 500 years from now, future art historians are gonna look back at Jack Kirby and Carmen Infantino as our Renaissance masters of the human figure. And you'll find it all in this book. Do you have a certain chapter dedicated to each artist? Yes. I chose, I call them the greatest generation. That's my pun on the Tom Brokaw book. But all of these men, Infantino, Ditko, Kirby, Kane, Kuber, Colin, Steranko, Neil Adams, they are, they are giants in our time. And like I said, we haven't seen their kind, we, we won't for generations. Everything happened in comics now, all the artists working now and for the past generation, all pray at the altar of these artists. I mean, look, The Flash, there's a new TV show now, it's the highest rated uh, television show on the CW network. But here's where Flash began, the art of Carmen Infantino. So in this spread, everything you want to know about The Flash is in this spread. So you'll really learn something and I think you'll love the book because I know there's really no other book like my book. Now in the book you also have an interview with uh, Steve Ditko where he talked about some of his characters. Well Ditko of course is the creator of Spider-Man. Stan Lee wrote the dialogue and came up with some of the characters but without Ditko's costume design which is really the most unique design in the history of comics there'd be no Spider-Man. The, the character was bandied about in comic book professional world for like 15 years. It wasn't until Ditko designed that costume and that's why this page, which in the original comics is like a three inch tall panel, but I blow it up the size of nine inches by 13 inches because my indirect point is until an artist puts pencil to paper, or in this case pen, there is no comic book creation. So while Stan Lee might have created Spider-Man verbally, it isn't a comic book creation until Ditko created it visually. So in places, like an entire book, I have Ditko talking about how he created things like Spidey Sense. So with the text here is not me talking, it's Ditko talking about that art right there. I'm standing with Scott and Maria Burke, and uh, how did you guys enjoy the event tonight? It's been great so far. We've come here a number of years, and I think this is uh, definitely one of the better ones. Uh, enjoyed the speakers, and uh, so far, uh, it's been a great event. And, and you're a big collector of superhero stuff, correct? That's correct, yes. But you're here because you live supporting him, right? Yes, that's right. I'm a dog collector. I don't collect superheroes or comics, but I have to support him in the collecting spirit. And um, I enjoy these events, too. I learn a lot about, you know, um, all the things that he collects, and it's fun. Great. And what did you, what did you buy today? So, so far I bought the uh, Silver Age of Comic Book Art by uh, Arlen Schumer, who was actually one of the speakers tonight. Um, and it's really just a good collection of a number of different artists from the Silver Age, which is in the 60s of, of comic books. Um, and he goes through each of the individual artists as well as a good collection of their work, uh, a lot of the images, the pictures. Um, it's great. It's in a hardcover format and good size pages and, and color printed, all of that. So uh, it looks like a good collection of some of that art from back then. Now I'm standing with Tim Estilos, the club member and MC of the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club. What did you bring today? Well, 
I heard that it was the 75th anniversary of Batman, of course, and so one of the items that I had, something actually pretty unique, almost almost one of a kind. There was a company out in western Massachusetts called Rayline that made a number of Batman products, but the unique item that I have is not something that was available to the general public, actually. In 1966, they had to put out certain store displays that each of the toy stores would demonstrate some of the equipment and the various items that they had. So this was a Batman parachute that they made available to a number of kids. But in order to sort of demonstrate it, they would put it on this armature that would hang over top of this fan, and the store owner would plug it in, the air would blow up into this parachute, the parachute would hang over it and fill up with air, and it would hang there, whoop, and gather the attention of all the people who were interested in wanting to buy it. What makes this item so unique is that the Rayline company went out of business. So this item has been pretty much uh, either destroyed or damaged all through the years, but this one guy out in western Massachusetts happened to have one that was quite unique and also really not available to the average collector. So that's the original box it came in? That's the original box that it came in. Of course, this would be the box that would be sent to the stores. That, of course, would be the, the parachute inside with uh, the Batman figure. The fan would blow it up in the air, and little boys and girls would gather around it all excited, saying, Hey, Mommy and Daddy, I want one of those things. So it was really cool to find this very unique collectible that really you can't buy in stores, and there may not be that many of them out there intact. How did you uh, find it? Basically found a guy who was selling a lot of toys. He said he had a big warehouse of stuff, and I kind of had to do like the American pickers and dig around, literally like them, dig around through a whole lot of different boxes and so forth, and found this one item. Turned out to be, wow, look at that thing. It looks like a pretty cool item. Paid $25 for it, and now it's mine. So I'm going to keep it for a while. I may auction it off at some point. Now I'm standing with Liz Larakis, and you're a club member. How'd you get involved with the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club? Um, I actually met them at the Super Mega Fest, I think, three years ago. So that's where I met them through there, and then I attended an event with them, and then I just joined from there. Are you a toy collector yourself? I'm mostly into comics and Legos. Uh, well, that's, that's, that counts in my opinion. Yeah. Now uh, it's Batman's 75th anniversary. Are you excited? I'm pretty excited. I mean, I've, I'm like it really into like certain characters, and I found that now that I'm going to more comic cons and doing toy club stuff, that I'm learning a lot more about the specific characters. Like the um, presentation that this happened, and it's really interesting. You learn a lot of things you never knew before. <laughs> so, you, so you were a fan of Batman and our? Yes, I'm a well, I'm a fan of Harley Quinn. I got my eye on that Harley Quinn bust on the silent auction. <laughs> Now I'm standing with Ted Michaelopoulos, and you're a club member. How did you get involved with the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club? Well, many years ago, I was at a Borders bookstore in Braintree, and I overheard a group of gentlemen at the cafe talking about toys. And me being uh, pretty much a lifelong collector since the age of nine, I inquired, what, 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 what are you guys, what's this all about? And they told me, well, we're a toy club, local local people. And from then on, I, I was hooked. Uh, it's a, just a great bunch of guys. We just get together our monthly meetings and this our yearly event. And uh, it's great to, you know, relive your uh, childhood passions. And, uh, you know, this is a big passion for me. I've been a... Uh, a lover of superheroes since I was a little kid and this is what I mainly collect and now that's all you hear about in the media with all the Marvel and DC movies it's it's uh, it's all all come around full circle since it's uh, Batman's birthday yes you, what's your favorite version of Batman my favorite version of Batman would be I'd have to say Jim Lee's version in the comics Though I did grow up with Batman on, on TV, and I loved it as a kid, I look back on it and it's, well, it's kind of campy. It really is. Campy in the fun way, though, campy the best possible way. way. Absolutely, campy in a fun way. And I liked it so much that when Mattel made the 1966 Batman figures and Batmobile, I bought it all. I'm standing with Andrew Buca, and you, what did you get today? Well, uh, tonight I got an action figure of Earth 2 Batman as Bruce Wayne. 
Uh, from my knowledge, it's basically just Bruce Wayne from an alternate universe. But he, but he's he's Batman. From how is he Earth too? Is it another Earth? Yes. Yes. What, what, what made you decide to get that character? Uh, well, really, I like how it's all put together. Uh, I like sort of the medieval look of some of the armor plates that he has on his suit. Do you collect a lot of Batman figures? Um, Batman, Superman, basically every DC comic character. Okay, here we are. Welcome, everybody. It's the most expensive thing I've ever bought myself, but I won't tell you how much I spent. But I did underbid the guy on eBay $500. That, of course, is Batman's first appearance 75 years ago this year, 1939. If we look closely at that first image, this is the Batman that the world first saw. But without one of the co-creators of Batman, and it wasn't Bob Kane, this is what Batman would have looked like. This tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Batman, Bob Kane, and a gentleman named Bill Finger. Bill Finger is really the man who made Batman, Batman. And again, my name is Arlen Schumer, and as we return to the original appearance of Batman, you open up to the first page. This is the famous page. If anybody's a Batman fan out there, you've seen it. We come in close to the top panel, and what do we see? Batman created by a guy named Robert Kane. Most of you know him as Bob Kane, real name Khan, K-A-H-N. Like a lot of American Jews, he changed his name to fit in with WASP society. The story of Batman and Bob Kane begins with really the story of Superman a year earlier. This is a shot of the newsstand in 1938. If you look down below, what do we see at the rack? Action Comics 1, the first appearance in 1938 created by the team of Siegel and Schuster. Siegel, the writer, standing above Joe Schuster, the artist. Bob Kane was working as an artist at DC Comics at that time, and he saw the money that Siegel and Schuster were making overnight because Superman was an overnight success. And he basically said, I want to do a character like that that makes money. Now, Bob Kane happened to have a writer partner friend named Bill Finger. Bill Finger is really the subject of my talk tonight. Bill Finger went on to create not only so much of the Batman mythos that you're familiar with, that the layman is familiar with, but as you can see by this collage, created so many other comic characters and stories. He co-created Green Lantern. He did all the work. He did Superboy for years, everything you see here. He's so much of comic history, yet his work and his name are relatively unknown to this day. Him and Bob Kane started working together in the mid to late 30s, and one of their first published comics by DC Comics was Rusty and His Pals. You can see Kane's style was very cartoony, and the whole idea of Rusty and His Pals was basically a knockoff of Terry and the Pirates. Most of the early comics and comic books were knockoffs of the great comic strips, like Terry and the Pirates. Anyway, this is a photo of Vincent Sullivan. He was one of the earliest editors of DC Comics. He edited what's considered the first comic book based on a single theme, Detective Comics, which appears in 1937. There's issue 26, the very issue before Detective 27 that had Batman's first appearance. You could see 
that um, Batman's first appearance is very closely tied in imagery to Superman. Basically, Vince Sullivan said to Bob Kane, if you want to make the money Siegel and Schuster are making, come up with a superhero. And that's what Bob Kane and Bill Finger came up with. But the world and most people know that Bob Kane is the sole creator of Batman. This was his 1989 autobiography done with the writer Tom Andre. And in that book were reproduced images that were reproduced for years in various fan magazines. But purportedly, if you look at this Bob Kane sketch, it's dated 1934, you can see in the center. And at first he was calling him Eagle Man. And other historians look at these illustrations and believe they were created later and post-dated to make it seem like Bob Kane had this idea for Batman for years. You can see in the notes that your bird, uh, your bird was, should, have no, should have no other way to fly like a bat. And he talks about Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines. These are famous sketches of da Vinci when he tried to create a flying machine, and he based the machine on the wings of a bat. You can see in another one of Bob Kane's illust uh, illustrations, this one down below dated 1939. And, you know, it even says in the writing, you know, the Batman created by Bob Kane. I mean, they're so self-serving that these cannot possibly have been created in the year that Kane claims that, we're, that they were created. And if you're thinking about the idea of a Batman, you could go back in other cultures. This is from Europe. This is an old postcard from the 19th century of a bat-winged flying person. This was a serial made in the 1930s, Batman of Africa. So this idea of a Batman had been around in the high and low cultures for years before Kane and Finger did Batman. Here's another one of his supposedly 1939 illustrations. What's really funny about this illustration and makes it such a forgery is that it's more slick and put together than the actual 1939 printed drawing of Batman from that first issue, Detective 27. And in fact, two years earlier, Bob Kane himself with Bill Finger did a strip for DC called Dr. Occult. And this is a panel from Dr. Occult. And if you look at the writing, stand the figure of the corpse and a Batman. So they themselves were banding around the idea of a Batman before 1939. And once again, if we come in close to this image, that was co-created by Batman and Bill Finger. What do I mean by co-created? Well, according to interviews and recorded uh, testimonies by both men, I decided back in 1999 to try to illustrate what that hypothetical, well, real sketch, never been published, that Bob Kane claims he did on the weekend that Vince Sullivan said, go home and create your own superhero. And he showed that sketch to Bill Finger. And Bill Finger made so many suggestions, as an art director would, that without Bill Finger, I put together this illustration that was the best I could put together of what that first sketch, that according to Finger and Kane's own testimony, looked like. For instance, if we come in close on the eyes, he had a domino mask very much like the first costume superhero, really, the Phantom, created in the uh, early 30s. The Phantom had a domino mask, but if you notice, his pupils aren't showing. Bob Kane had the pupil showing, according to Bill Finger, so Bill Finger said, get the pupils out of the eye, and then, it must have been a Finger's house because he reached up to get his dictionary and he said, Bob, and he looked up the word bat and he goes, you should make the headpiece more like a bat. This is from the 1936 Webster Dictionary. My mother happened to have the 1936 Webster Dictionary and I bet you this dictionary image is probably the same one Finger used to show Bob Kane, which is why you got Batman's cowl looking like this in the very first house ad for Batman versus what that original sketch looked like. The figure, well, I read in the interviews that Vin Sullivan said that Bob Kane, like a lot of the young comics strip artists, was notorious for tracing and copying poses by Alex Raymond, the Flash Gordon. Along with Hal Foster, Milton Kniff, Alex Raymond was, the, you know, the, the, that was the triad of realistic drawing in comics of adventure strip characters. If you look at this uh, Sunday where I took that 
Alex Raymond image from, I needed a figure to base that first Batman sketch on. So I went to my reprint collection, basically just looking for a figure that would look good to do this hypothetical early Batman sketch. Well, look at what I actually discovered from a daily strip from 1937, two years before the 1939 Batman. What do we have here? The actual pose that Kane lifted for Detective 27. There's the rope, the bent knees, and everything. I ended up putting together this image in a collage format. If you notice, there's bits and pieces of some of the things I've been discussing tonight, and I did this in 1999 for a special issue of the comic book trade history magazine, Alter Ego, uh, edited by Roy Thomas, the great Marvel Comics writer. And in it, I have a multiple page article called the Batman cover story in which I describe all of these elements. Like for instance, in the lower left corner, you see uh, circled out, Batman was partially based on the great Zorro acted out by Douglas Fairbanks, who was the first real action hero in American movies. If you look down below at my collage, I've got a copy of a shadow pulp cover. The shadow was a major influence on the early Batman, the darkness, the mystery. And in fact, the shadow used, you know, those twin guns blazing. The early Batman, before Robin, used the gun. You can see in the splash. Look at this famous cover, Detective 33, and there's Batman with a pistol on his, on his holster. This issue is also famous for having the first origin of Batman that we all know, of course, where um, young Bruce Wayne and his parents are coming home from a movie and they get accosted by a criminal who shoots them both dead. You're all familiar with this. This is like the nine stations of the cross of Batman. When we go in close, we could all identify as kids. This is the primal appeal of Batman, of losing our parents to violence. Well, Something circulated, uh, information recently by Mark Tyler Nobleman, who did a book about Siegel and Schuster. And what was found out was that in 1932, a year before Siegel creates Superman with Schuster, this is a picture of Siegel. His father in Cleveland had a men's clothing store and they were held up. And while he wasn't shot dead, he died afterwards from the anxiety. He basically got a heart attack from the trauma. So there's very good reason that maybe some of that influence, because Kane worked at DC alongside Siegel and Schuster, that perhaps some of that, because if you think about it, what does Siegel do the next year? He creates Superman, the ultimate father figure coming down from the sky to save him. He basically replaced his dead father. So much of the early Batman mythos is created by Bill Finger. The very name Bruce Wayne, Came, comes from Bill Finger, he named the Bruce after Robert Bruce, the great Scottish patriot. And the name Wayne came from the Revolutionary War hero, Mad Anthony Wayne. But Bob Kane, the artist, was a notorious swiper. If you look at this famous image, what do we see here? This comes from an illustration from one of the big little books of the 1930s. These were literally miniature books about that thick that were illustrated kind of with text and image like an early graphic novel in a way. And Kane basically swiped so much of his art. And again, all the young comic artists did. But Kane in particular was pretty notorious. The final image of Batman at the bottom of the page, that's a Hal Foster Tarzan that you can see taken from that strip. Hal Foster, of course, again, the third great realistic comic strip artist that all the young comic artists like Kane based their work on. There's another early Batman that surfaced a couple years ago. This is a drawing from 1932 by a guy named Frank Foster who signed it on the back with the names Batman and Nightwing. And supposedly, according to his family, he circulated these images up at the early DC Comics. Back then, it was called National Periodical Publications. But if you look closely at this character that he supposedly claims is an early version of Batman, you could see the influence, again, on that early Batman, this being, again, one of the very early house ads. You look at this dark Batman in the 1930s, there were the pulps, which were illustrated stories with you know miniature pictures interspersed. And what do we have here in the 1930s? The black bat. 
Uh, he's more of a vigilante. You don't, he doesn't have the bat wings, but he definitely has the scalloped black cape. And you go back further in science fiction, you see this pulp novel cover, and it's the human bat. You go back further to the Penny Dreadfuls in England, and you have a kind of a villain called the spring Heel Jack that has that sort of Batman-draped cape. But maybe the biggest influence of the cape on Batman was probably Dracula appearing in 1931, Bela Lugosi. If you look at the way he used the cape, basically the appeal of Batman is they took the darkness, the satanicness of the villain, and made it into the hero. Another major influence in the 1920s, according to Bob Kane himself, was a play called The Bat. And this is the promotion for it. And you can see it was a closed door murder mystery. Here's another lobby card. In this case, The Bat was a villain. So it starts out as a stage play, and it's made into a silent movie that Kane claims he saw. Here's the title card. It was a big influence. Here's a lobby card from the movie. And you can see the bat is a villain, and the costume is based more on a real bat. And again, the quality of these images is all that really exists. The way that this bat menaced the socialites inside the mansion was he would flash, yes, a bat signal. And of course, the bat signal doesn't appear in the comics till like 1946. But again, that's another co-creation of Khan and Finger. But the third person involved in the early creation of Batman, you must know his name, Jerry Robinson, who later went on to be a, a famous syndicated cartoonist, but he was Bob Kane's first assistant. I think he hired him, he was like 17 years old. But as you can see in the cover of his autobiography, Robinson is instrumental in the creation of two of the key characters of Batman, both Robin and the Joker. So the story of Robin and the Joker is kind of like Rashomon. You've got Kane, Finger, and Robinson each claim to have their part of the creation of Robin and the Joker. But as I'm going to show you, each one of them has a very good claim. So in the end, we can only give attribution literally to all three of them. Robin appears in 1940, a year after Batman appears, and according to Jerry Robinson, it was influenced by Sherlock Holmes. Not so much the novels, as much as the movies that start to appear in the late 30s with, of course, Basil Rathbone as um, Sherlock Holmes. But what Robinson took from it is the fact that he had a partner, Watson, that Holmes could talk to. And after the first year of Batman and solo adventures, you got to remember, comic writers were not that savvy with thought balloons and interior monologues and things we have now. They felt Batman needed to have somebody to talk to, and that's where Robin comes from. Now, the costume, according to Robinson, he took from Robin Hood. These were books that were around in the 20s and 30s when he was young, illustrated by N.C. Wyatt, the father of Andrew Wyatt. You could see that they influenced the Douglas Fairbanks silent film, Robin Hood. But another little known influence that had to be on Robin was once again, Alex Raymond from 1937 has Dale Arden, uh, Flash Gordon's girlfriend, come to a costume uh, party dressed in that outfit, and you can't tell me that that's basically, if they were looking at Alex Raymond figures to trace Batman from, that had to be some kind of influence on Robin. In this very first issue of Batman, you have the first appearance of the Joker, which once again, Robinson claims he created based on the famous Joker playing card, and this was the sketch that Robinson claims he showed to Bob Kane. In that first story, the actual card is an element in the story itself. You can see on the upper right corner. If you look down below at the close-up of the Joker, you've got Bill Finger's side of the creation of the Joker because he claims it comes from the film starring Conrad Veidt, who was in Casablanca, as The Man Who Laughs, which was a silent film that was um, based on a Victor Hugo novel, the man who did Les Miserables and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it was a tragedy about a young boy that gets um, uh, scarred by hoodlums and his face is frozen into this rictus of a grin. And according to Bill Finger, he came in with photographs and gave them to Bob Kane. And that's why you can see the influence in these very first images of the Joker. 
But then you have Bob Kane's claim that he, that he took the Joker from the steeplechase ride over in Coney Island. Because if you look at that character that's still there, that was on the ticket, and here's one of the posters, you can also see the influence of the Joker there. In that first issue as well, you've got the first appearance of the Catwoman. That was her very earliest costume, and you can see in this figure of her without the costume on, Bob Kane claims he based her on the screen actress, the it girl of the time, Jean Harlow, and you can see the influence there. She was sassy and talked back and had a mind of her own, and that's what they wanted to have in Catwoman. Also in that first issue, you've got a text feature in the back of the comic where DC Comics promotes the fact that Bob Kane is the sole creator of Batman. Bill Finger is not even mentioned in this text. So right from the beginning, because Bob Kane, his, lawyer, his father was a lawyer, and he went into DC, and his father said, make sure you get your name on it, Bill Finger was in the background. Bill Finger just thought he was his partner, and he was left off the strip. A couple of years later, in 1946, DC Comics puts out this story in a comic book called Real Fact Comics, which is all comic book stories based on supposedly real life stories. And they decided to do a story of how a big time comic is born. Look at the cover. They took that classic spotlight cover from Batman number nine from 1940, illustrated by the great Jack Burnley, my personal favorite. He did all those Sunday Batman comics. He's my favorite early Batman artist over Bob Kane himself. That image was so successful that DC Comics would recycle it over and over again. They would flop it, and that's how you get that cover of real fat comics. In my 1999 alter ego issue, I did a text story about that story and really about how a ludicrous whitewash it is. So I talk about it and I print samples from the story supposedly told from Bob Kane's point of view of how he had the costume made and hired a friend to pose it for him. And it's a costume his mother made, according to Bob Kane and DC Comics. Everything in this story seems to just pop out of Bob Kane's imagination. Oh, I'll come up with the Joker. And the story ends where Batman, once a dream, had bought Bob Kane fame and fortune. Thank you, Bob Kane, for bringing us to life. That's the last pound of the story. You could see that there's Bob Kane, the interior architect, coming up in the Batcave. The Batcave was created by Bill Finger. The bat plane down below, the Batmobile, so many elements, Wayne Manor, all created by Bill Finger, but attributed to Bob Kane. Now, there's a reason why this story appears in 1946, because that's the year Jerry Siegel comes back from the war. He had been there like a lot of the early comic artists for a couple of years. Before he left, he pitched to DC Comics the idea of a Superboy series. DC turned it down. But when he returns from the war, what does he find? DC went ahead and published Superboy without basically any of Jerry Siegel's cooperation. That is the year that Siegel and Schuster take DC Comics to court, which ends up blackballing them from the industry and leading to the story of Siegel and Schuster, which is basically a tragedy that they went and fought DC Comics for like 13 years and ended up pretty much losing everything and becoming destitute. But According to this, I think Siegel wanted uh, uh, Finger to leave with him, but he didn't. Finger stays, and he goes on to, again, create the rest of the Batman mythos, villains like the Penguin. Bob Kane claims he created the Penguin from the advertisements for cool cigarettes that ran in magazines in the late 30s and early 40s. In 1948, Bill Finger creates the Riddler. Basically a grade B villain for Batman, but the reason why, of course, everybody knows the Riddler is because he was featured in the very first Batman TV show episode and became literally one of the four prime Batman villains, along with Catwoman, Joker, and Penguin. But really, the Riddler never was of equal stature with them, but because of the TV show, which, of course, in 1966, brought Batman to the world in a way that nothing had ever 
uh, accomplished that kind of impact on American pop culture. But you can see from the animated opening that the Batman comes from the Batman that Bob Kane and Bill Finger created together, and you could see the influence on just the opening animation. But what the TV series did for Bob Kane was that overnight it made him a celebrity. And here he is in 1966, I guess that's his wife at the time, I think he had a couple of wives, I'm not sure. But he immediately becomes a fine art pop star in the age of pop art and creates these paintings even though he hadn't been drawing Batman literally for years. Ghost artists like Sheldon Moldoff who drew this house ad, but you could see it's all about Bob Kane and so much of the merchandising of the 66 series was all about Bob Kane. And the name Bill Finger wasn't even mentioned, even though he was still writing comics for DC Comics at the time. The only involvement of Bill Finger with a TV series is this blurry image I was able to get off the air. The one episode, two-parter, that he wrote was the Clock King episode. And there's an image of him. Here's an image from the show. There's the stuntman hanging out in the background off camera there. But... Once again, you go back to 1948, Bill Finger creates The Clock King in Star Spangled Comics, which featured Robin solo stories. But in 1966, all you saw in mainstream magazines was pictures of Bob Kane with his Batman paintings, making money hand over fist during the height of the pop art movement in New York City. Kane had no problem with pasting up other artists' work that drew Batman, because in Kane's mind, he was old school. He felt he was the creator, and it didn't really matter who drew Batman. He could still claim artistically that he created Batman. That image down below is by the great team of Infantino and Anderson. In 1965, Kane writes in to a fanzine, Batmania magazine, and basically lies and says that he pencils and inks the letters of Mr. Barnes out. He doesn't draw 90% of the Batman stories. Sheldon Moldoff was doing 100%. Kane did nothing and lied and got away with it. Ironically, in his 1989 autobiography, the very image on the cover of Batman is not by Bob Kane. It's by Jerry, Robins, uh, by Jerry Robinson in one of the very earliest issues of Batman. And that's where they took that figure from. But as the years went on, all you ever saw was Bob Kane, creator of Batman. Here he is with Michael Keaton. A couple years later, always posing with those images of Batman. Here's his tombstone when he dies in 1995. And I know the lettering you can't read, but I mean, it's so grandiose. God bestowed a dream upon Bob Kane, blessed with imagination and a legacy and blah, 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 blah. I mean, so self-serving. But what happened to Bill Finger? He dies in 1973, penniless. In 1974, DC Comics creates this image, and they write about Bill Finger. For many of us reading comics at the time, it was the first time we even heard his name. When he was actually writing the comics, his name wasn't credited. Barely anybody knew who wrote the Batman stories in those days. So we only heard Bill Finger's name upon his death. In 1974, when Carmen Infantino, as publisher of DC, puts out the famous first editions, the oversized treasury magazines, Infantino writes a personal... A story about what Bill Finger was about. So he took it upon himself to credit Finger. The very first comic convention I went to was in New York in 1973 at the old Commodore Hotel, which is now the Grand Hyatt, next to the Grand Central. I was 15 years old. Bob Kane was the keynote speaker. It was my first experience at a comic convention. And all I remember in the Grand Ballroom, I was all the way in the back, but Bob Kane was keynote speaking. And all I remember him saying, and this is in summer of 73, when Finger was still alive, and all he's saying is, I created Batman, I created Robin, I created jo I, 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 I. That's all I remember. And the following winter, his friend, his partner, dies penniless. So in 1999, years later, I do this issue of Alter Ego, but I had been involved with Batman basically since I was a kid, 12 years old in 1970, I decided to draw my own version of the origin of Batman, 
Of course, I was influenced, as everybody in my generation was, by what the great artist Neil Adams was doing with Batman. Post the TV show, he single-handedly brings Batman back to his creature of the night status. And you could see the influence in my 12-year-old fountain pen drawing. Look at the upper left corner. Even back then, the young graphic designer in me wanted to do a DC Comics knockoff type seal. But keep that image in mind, because we're going to return to this. But you can see, for 12 years old, I was doing layouts like this, once again, influenced probably by Neil Adams, setting images inside panels. And there he becomes Batman. Look at that giant cape, totally, you know, Neil Adams. I had known about Batmania, the fanzine, which began publishing in 1964 when Julia Schwartz debuts what's called The New Look. But it was still being published in 1975 when I was in high school, and it was being edited now by Rich Morrissey, who comes from Framingham. He passed away about 15 years ago, but he was a major comic book fan, and I wrote to him, and I said, I want to be the art director of Batmania. I didn't even know what art direction was. I was in high school. But that's one of my first illustrations for the first issue. Here's a double-page spread pinup. And you can see everything I'm doing is totally influenced by Neil Adams. When I was a senior in high school, I did that image. And once again, you could see the influence that came from the great Neil Adams. He basically single-handedly uh, recreated the look of comic book art with his photorealistic style. This was a famous self-portrait that he does in 1970. What Adams d did was he went back to the source 1939, when Bob Kane was actually drawing Batman in his gothic, cartoony style, but he updated him. In today's parlance, you would use the word reboot, but Neil Adams recreated Batman for our time, and there would be no dark night of the movies without what Neil Adams single-handedly did in 1968, 69, and 70. I've done many projects about Neil Adams' Batman and Neil Adams himself over the years. Magazine articles, essays, vis verbal visual features. On the right corner, I did the Neil Adams sketchbook. That wasn't supposed to be the cover. I wanted the title page to be the cover, but the publisher didn't want to spend the licensing fee that DC Comics was charging. But you could see this is a six inch by nine inch notebook page, and it turned into one of Neil Adams' great splash pages. In addition to what he brought to Batman in terms of dynamism, I also love Neil Adams for his quieter panels like this, one of my most favorite of his Batman images because it shows here in the restraint of not only the drawing but the coloring. And I ended up using this image for the Facebook group that I run called Neil Adams Almanac. Adams is like the Mississippi River of comics history, and the tributaries that run off of him are really making for some incredible comics history discussions. And I thought I saw all the Neil Adams artwork because I thought I was a Neil Adams expert. But man, if you come and join my group and you love comic art and comic history, your eyes are going to bug out when you see some of the art people are posting of images that I've never seen before. But I was lucky enough to be influenced by the artists who came before Neil Adams, like Carmine Infantino, who br brings in the new look in 64, before Neil Adams. And you could see it was Infantino's Batman that was operating at the time the TV show hit. I used this classic image as an illustrator working in a comic book style in the commercial um, arena of advertising and editorial illustration. So for Entertainment Weekly in 1993, after the second Batman movie by Burton came out, I was asked to do this illustration of Batman reviewing the videos of his first two uh, movies, and I based it on that classic Batman cover. I also love Batman the Animated Series by Bruce Timm that appears in 1992. So in 1993, I got to convince Pop Shots, the three-dimensional greeting card company, to do a series of superhero cards and to pursue the license so I got to do the artwork for this birthday card. Here it is in an art exhibit. You can see it's like it folds out like it's in three dimensions. And these uh, origami designers figured out how to take the flat artwork and turn it into that sort of pop, uh, pop out uh, three-dimensional card effect. 
So whenever I've had the chance to draw Batman kind of legally for magazines, my style is a mixture of a kind of a Neil Adams realism with the more stylized cartooniness that is basically what I try to do when I do artwork like this for magazines, when I get the chance to do the actual characters. For the New York Times a couple of years ago, I did this illustration. So, you know, that's the modern filmic Batman with that all black outfit. In 08 for Rolling Stone magazine, when Iron Man, Indiana Jones, and The Dark Knight all came out the same year, I created this illustration. A couple of years ago for the Washington Post magazine, they had a story about a blind comic book artist who with his seeing partner, they're a dynamic duo creating comic book art together. So I based this cover that I did on the classic Infantino Anderson Batman that has become one of the most iconic dynamic duo images of all. But of course, I still love the only Golden Age comic I actually own because I can afford it is the classic Batman number nine. Here I am on that AMC show Comic Book Men in its first season. This episode aired in 2012, and there I am selling, or supposedly selling, my framed copy of Batman number nine, because I'm never gonna read it, it's too brittle. But I bought it just for that cover, and here's how they featured it in an on-air graphic. I used that image in an exhibit design I put together a couple of years ago, as we zoom out, it's all about that Jerry Robinson era of Batman. This is actually a 55 inch by 27 inch, kind of almost the size of this screen image. But these were a series of hanging panels in the Words and Pictures Museum in Northampton, Massachusetts, that is no longer there. This was run by Kevin Eastman, one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, what he decided to do with his money. So in 1997, they had a Batman exhibit and they asked me to create a series of panels that would explain the history of Batman. And that's what I did. I called it the graphic history of Batman. And you could see the um, Robinson panel all the way on the right. There's the second panel. And you could see that I was, I've been playing with these images of Da Vinci and mixing them verbally and visually with Bob Kane's early images to get across the history of Batman. Years earlier, in 1989, when the first Tim Burton movie came out, I pitched to the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan to let me come and do, back then, they were slideshows, pre-computer. But you can see, as far back as 1989, I was working with this Da Vinci Batman joint concept, and you could see the influence 10 years later when I did this in 1999. There's a great website called Dial B for Blog by a guy who uses the pseudonym Robbie Reed. But it's a great comics history blog all about the Silver Age, basically. It's really incredible. But a couple of years ago, in 07, he did his expose on Bob Kane and the swiping. And so much of what I just showed you tonight, I got from uh, Robbie Reed's website. And he actually paid homage to me when he points out that, yes, indeed, I discovered the swipe to Detective 27. Ever since I created this image, this is from an Italian magazine recently, I've noticed that image has really gotten out there into the pop culture world. I often don't get credited for it, but it's become an image that people think what was the actual published image of Bob Kane. Mark Tyler Nobleman, who I told you did the story about Super, uh, Siegel and Schuster, he recently did a book all about Bill Finger. It came out, uh, I think, two years ago. Ty Templeton was the illustrator, and you could see he did his version of basically what I did 10 years earlier. Templeton recently did this illustration. What if Bob Kane had gone in and created Batman without Bill Finger? And it kind of shows him. By the way, if you notice, Bob Kane had stiff bat wings instead of the scalloped cape. Bill Finger, that was another art direction decision. It was Bill Finger who basically said, don't give him stiff bat wings, give him a cape that echoes the look of bat wings by scalloping it at the bottom. I've noticed recent illustrations online that talk about Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Look how in Bob Kane's balloon, he's got the red suited image but in Bill Finger's balloon, in his imagination, you pretty much have the entire Bat mythos created by Bill Finger. 
Look at this illustration, not as well drawn, but it's Bob Kane pitching Batman to Vin Sullivan at, without Bill Finger, and Vin Sullivan is telling him to leave. If you go on Facebook and look up Bill Finger, uh, Travis Langley, who's a professor um, in, I think, Ohio maybe, I'm not sure, but he's been working on an independent documentary film about Bill Finger, and here is the lobby card you'll come to. Yeah, that's what Bob Kane said, by the way, after Bill Finger died. Then he starts crying crocodile tears about my poor partner, Bill Finger. But through his entire life, he lived like a king, while Bill Finger, with alcoholism and everything else, literally declined and died at the age, I think he was 59, very young. In New York City, Roberto Williams is a, a high school music and voice teacher. He's done a off-off-Broadway play using his own high school talent called The Fathers of the Dark Night, where he dresses up his students in these really very professional-looking costumes. And when I met him two years ago, the first thing I said was, how can I help you, Roberto? Do you have a poster? Do you have a logo? So I ended up creating this image for his show, and it ran a couple months ago, and I think he's going to restage it somewhere in Manhattan for next year. But this was the original sketch I showed him. And if you look closely at the H and Fathers, I didn't want to connect the poles of the H with the Batman mask because I thought it would destroy the integrity of the letter H. And a friend of mine, it was Robbie Reed of Dial B for Blog, he said, Arlen, you really got to put, you know, the Batman mask up there. So I took his advice, and you could see in the finish, I noticed that as long as it's far enough away from the crossbar of the H, you still read it as fathers. I was afraid it would read, in a sense, as an A, but the human mind puts a word together if it has enough letters to form that word. Of course, we see the effect of Bill Finger's influence on the culture today when you've got the TV show Gotham, which was created, once again, Bill Finger is the one who named Batman's city Gotham. I think in one of the very first stories, it's called New York. And of course, Gotham was another name for New York, but it was Bill Finger. Here's DC Comics' official logo for 75 years of Batman. Um, I hate to say it, but maybe that's one of the worst logos I've ever seen coming from a professional company. But if you look at DC's new logo, the peel off sticker logo, I mean, don't get me started. I'd like to think that my logo for Batman's 75th anniversary, promoting the name of Bill Finger, the man who made Batman Batman, is really the truer logo that should be out there and affecting people. But it's nice to see that there is a movement around now. I mean, I've been involved in this obviously for years, but there's more movement than ever to get Bill Finger's name in the same way that Siegel and Schuster got their names restored to Batman. There is a movement with Athena Finger, his granddaughter, to try to get DC and Warner Brothers to do the right thing and put Bill Finger's name next to Bob Kane's. But I'm also here tonight because I just came out with a revised version of my book that's very dear to me, uh, the Silver Age of Comic Art, and of course, Batman is well represented in my book because it was Infantino's Batman in 1964 that jump-started the character. This was before the TV show. And Batman was on the verge of cancellation in 1963 because of the Sheldon Moldoff artwork, because of the lousy stories that, in a sense, what the TV show adapted was that version of Batman. They didn't adapt the Infantino version, which was sleeker and cooler. If you notice in the very first house ad, DC Comics was actually marketing the artwork. You got to realize how important that was for kids to be talked about about the artwork. A whole generation, like me, became artists because of comic art like this. But it's pretty amazing if any of you are educators out there teaching children, the fact that a major corporation was promoting artwork to children is a very special, unique, beautiful thing, which is one of the things that makes comics great. Here's a spread I put together of all of Infantino's great covers. He became the editorial director and eventually publisher of DC Comics on the strength of his covers. 
And all of the text, most of the text in the book is not me talking, it's the artist talking about the artwork. But one of his greatest covers is not represented here. You turn the page and you see this double page spread of two covers he did in 1967, obviously for Batman here, and The Flash, his other iconic character of Infantino. But Infantino had to fight with the publisher of DC at the time. They said, we don't have the Batman logo at the top of the page. Because in those days, they were worried that only the top of the cover stuck out on the rack. So Infantino's answer to the DC publisher was, you don't need the Batman logo. You've got Batman himself up there. And it ended up being the biggest selling Batman comic of that year. When you open up the dust jacket to my book, the wraparound case wrap illustration is an illustration I did. You can see Infantino's flash there. Very rare that Marvel and DC, who I needed permission for, from to do my book, allow a joint illustration of both companies' characters. They allowed me to do it in a more pop art way with the bigger dots and they let me actually sign it, all very rare, and I'd like to think the case wrap illustration is worth the price of admission. I based it on one of Neil Adams' classic covers, which he based on covers from the 1940s of the lineup of characters with the spotlight on the front cover. And Alex Ross has taken this idea and basically made a whole career out of it. You could see for uh, the Batman figure, I used that image of Neil Adams. I remember seeing this cover in 1970 when it came out. I was 12 years old in a candy store in the Bronx where my grandmother lived and we visited her and there was that little store and I walked in and I saw this cover from 12 feet away and I remember audibly gasping at how great it was and I think to this day it's still Neil Adams' greatest Batman image. In my Silver Age book, of course, because he takes on Batman in 1968 in Brave and Bold, a team-up title. And remember I told you I got my ideas for setting images within images? It comes from Neil Adams. This particular story, the team-up with Sergeant Rock in 1969, I used only images from that one issue in my book to get across the impact that Neil Adams had overnight on giving Batman his Creature of the Night status. I find as a historian that other people over the years have been credited. Frank Miller, Dark Knight, they credit Denny O'Neill, the writer. They don't give Neil Adams his props, but without Neil Adams, there would be no Dark Knight. I've also used this cover image for a series of webinars, live web events I'll be doing later this fall based on each of the artists in the book. These guys are like our Renaissance masters of the human figure. I do a lecture called Art and Comic Book Art where I compare Kirby and Adams to Michelangelo and Raphael and Da Vinci, the way we look back 500 years on the Renaissance masters of the human figure. I really believe that 500 years from now, future historians are gonna look back on our great Renaissance masters of the human figure who are comic book superhero artists. And that's what, again, you'll find in my book here tonight. In addition, I'm very proud to say that there'll be an ebook version for the new generation that's reading books on electronic platforms. But let me tell you something, these images, the bright colors on the electronic platforms literally leap off the screen. I worked up a self-promotional image because a friend called me the Silver Age Sensei. So I turned myself a little self-portrait into Doctor Strange saying the Silver Age comes to the digital age. But of course, I'm a DC Comics fan before I was ever a fan of Marvel Comics. And I finally got around to doing that logo image that I was gonna do back when I was 12 years old. And I only got around to doing it like a year ago, but there it is. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's really been great to present here. I hope you'll come over and check out the book. Go to my website, arlenschumer.com. You can sign up for a hardcover. You can get it here at a discount of $40 instead of 50, banquet special. And um, the book is my life. It's one of my children. And um, you guys, it debuted a week ago at the New York Comic Convention. But you guys are really the first people to get it after New York. And um, I really am so happy to be able to present here tonight and to show you a book that is really, I think, if you love comic book art 
and the artists who did it, I think you're going to love my book. So thanks again, and um, thank you to um, Stephen and Tim for having me here, and I hope to meet all of you afterwards and come chat and everything else. Thank you. Things are winding down here at the Boston Area Toy Collectors Club here at the Lantaner and Randolph. What you hear behind me is an auction that's going on. As you can tell, this is a great event and with great tributes this year to Batman and the Man from UNCLE and so many others. Uh, we saw some great toys and heard some great presentations. For Randolph Community TV, I'm David Chicarella. Thanks for watching.